Yeah, thanks, Madison. Uh, Bonjour, everyone. My name is Steve Shire, and I am the climate specialist at the 1854 Treaty Authority. Uh, it's 1854 Treaty Authority, if you don't know, is an intertribal organization that works to protect and preserve the off reservation treaty rights for the Boys Fort and Grand Portage Bands of Ojibwe. I, as well as the uh, rest of the Twin Ports Climate Conversation Planning Team, want to express our gratitude to you all for taking time out of your day to join our event. Um, the Twin Ports Climate Conversation is a collaboration be between the Minnesota Coastal Program, Minnesota Sea Grant, City of Superior, and the 1854 Treaty Authority. Um, we hope to uh, inspire and facilitate collaboration and education within our community. Uh, if you weren't already aware, today's topic is climate change and wildlife stewardship in the 1854 ceded territory. Uh, with climate change expected to cause shifts in species range, what does that mean for the beings and in indigenous communities that care for each other when they can no longer coexist? What effects or re repercussions might that have on traditional lifeways? With that thought, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. Our first speaker is, is Morgan Swingen in the 1854 Treaty Authority uh, wildlife biologist. Um, she's working intimately with moose throughout the Arrowhead region of Northeast Minnesota. Um, moose are considered highly vulnerable to the effects of climate change and may already be showing signs of environmental stress. Uh, our second speaker is Mike Schrag, who is with the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. He is their wildlife biologist and also does great work to conserve the moose population. Additionally, he's involved in working to reintroduce elk to the area around the Fond du Lac Reservation. Uh, elk are projected to be a hardier species, better equipped to handle the incoming environmental challenges. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Morgan. Miigwech. Thank you, Steve. Let me get my presentation going here. Okay, hopefully that looks okay. Okay, so as Steve said, yeah, my name is Morgan Swingen. I'm the wildlife biologist here at the 1854 Treaty Authority. Um, Steve mentioned that we're an intertribal natural resources agency uh, that works for the Boys Fort and Grand Portage Bands. Um, so my agency works throughout the 1854 ceded territory, which you can see outlined on this map, uh, this area of what is now Northeastern Minnesota was ceded to the United States government under the 1854 Treaty of La Pointe. And as part of that treaty, uh, three Native American bands retain their rights to hunt, fish, and gather off reservation within these boundaries. Uh, and one important thing to note is that the boundaries are fixed in place. They're written into the treaty. Um, and as climate change occurs, the natural resources available within these boundaries may begin to change. And as I mentioned, uh, my agency works for two of those bands, and we work to protect and preserve treaty rights and the resources that they're based on. And moose are one of the most important subsistence species for the bands that I work for. Um, so we're very involved in moose monitoring and management in the state. Um, so just some basic background on moose, um, or moose as they're called in Ojibwe. They're the largest member of the deer family, so that means they're closely related to white-tailed deer, elk, and caribou. Uh, there are four subspecies of moose in North America. Here in Minnesota, we have what's called the western and northwestern subspecies of moose. And you can see from the range map in the middle of the screen here, um, that we are pretty much at the southern extent of moose range in North America. Um, moose are generally a northern species existing mostly in boreal forests, both here in North America and across boreal regions of Europe and Asia. Um, and that's because moose are a cold adapted species. So moose have large bodies, they have thick skin, thick fur, and that keeps them warm. Uh, they also have long legs that make it easy for them to move through deep snow in these areas. Uh, moose are herbivores, so they eat plants. Um, since moose are so large, they need to eat a large volume of plant material. That can be up to 50 pounds of food per day in the summertime. And during the summertime, moose are eating things like leaves of terrestrial plants and aquatic plants. And then in the wintertime, they're eating small twigs usually of like young trees and shrubs. 
So back in the 1980s, moose in Minnesota were concentrated into two separate populations, as you can see um, in the map on the left here. Uh, the dark gray regions um, were considered primary moose range with higher densities of moose, and the lighter gray was lower density moose, kind of secondary moose range. Um, and as you can see, although, you know, moose were existed throughout northern Minnesota, they were kind of separated into these distinct areas of the state, and those areas were monitored separately. Um, usually by annual aerial survey. And in the mid to late 1990s, the population up in northwestern Minnesota crashed very quickly. Um, subsequent research found that parasites uh, played a major role in the decline in the northwest. So today, most of Minnesota's moose are found in northeastern Minnesota. Um, the moose here continue to be monitored annually via aerial surveys. This graph is showing the estimates of the moose population size in northeastern Minnesota. And starting in about 2010, um, we started to see a decline in the northeastern moose population, which caused concern uh, following the decline of the northwestern population. So a large scale effort to study moose mortality uh, was launched to, to understand the factors impacting moose survival here in the northeast. Uh, so to do that, uh, biologists radio collared um, over 150 moose in this area and monitored them. And during the four years of that study, 57 moose mortalities were examined, um, usually within 48 hours of a moose dying. And this pie chart is showing the major causes of mortality found in that study. Uh, the big three, as you can see here, were predation by wolves, parasites, and infections. And I'm gonna highlight parasites here. Parasites were the direct cause of 30% of moose deaths. Uh, so the second pie chart is just um, deaths due to parasites. And you can see out of all the parasite related mortality, there were three main um, parasites impacting moose, brainworm, winter ticks, and liver flukes. Um, parasites also likely played a role in additional mortalities. Um, it, the study found that at least four of the moose that were killed by wolves were likely predisposed to that predation due to brainworm infections. Um, brainworm may have also played a role in one of the deaths um, due to bacterial infection. And um, so these are the factors directly impacting moose survival in northeastern Minnesota. Um, so now how does this relate to climate? Um, so we know that the climate in our region has already been changing. Um, observed changes include increased temperatures on average, increased precipitation, and longer growing seasons, so the frost-free season of the year. And these, project these changes are projected to continue into the future um, with even higher temperatures, increased precipitation, and increased severe precipitation events. So these changes can directly impact moose. As I mentioned earlier, moose are adapted to cold climates. Um, the normal body temperature of a moose is between 38.4 and 38.9 degrees Celsius. Um, observational studies of moose in captive settings have showed that they change their behavior. Um, so the their respirations increase, they're breathing faster, they might begin panting. Um, when ambient temperatures were above about 20 degrees Celsius in summer, which is only 68 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and above negative two degrees, negative five degrees Celsius in wintertime, which is about 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, recently, biologists at the Minnesota DNR wanted to test these threshold theories um, in wild, free-ranging moose. So they used internal temperature monitors. Um, and then paired that data with um, ambient temperature data from weather stations. So this study was looking at uh, when the internal body temperature of moose was above that normal threshold. So they looked at days where the internal body temperature exceeded 39.2 degrees Celsius. And this is some of the data from that study. Um, so this Char these charts are showing um, moose internal body temperatures on the y-axis 
and the ambient um, outside high temperatures each day on the x-axis. Uh, the data here are separated by season. Uh, and on each graph, there's a red line. That's that line at, it's at 39.2 degrees Celsius. So that's kind of the hot, hot moose line. So all the data points above that line are days um, on which the moose had a high body temperature. And you can see from these graphs that moose internal body temperatures could were elevated um, at some point during all seasons and at all sorts of ambient temperatures, but that uh, moose body temperatures were highest most consistently during the summer season. Um, this might seem pretty obvious, um, but some prior research had theorized that uh, moose heat stress might be most common during fall and spring uh, when moose have their winter coats, um, but the outside temperatures can still be warm. So I'm just going to focus on the summer season here. So this graph, again, is showing moose internal temperature on the y-axis and ambient temperature on the x-axis. And there's a gray line plotted here. So that's a positive correlation between ambient temperature and moose internal temperature. And you can see this gray line crosses that kind of hot, hot moose line, the red line, um, at about 25 degrees Celsius. So that's about 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So moose were more likely to be heat stressed um, at ambient temperatures above 25 degrees Celsius in the summertime. Uh, and when moose get hot, uh, they have to take breaks. They can cool off by lying in the shade, getting in the water, um, but they have to reduce their activity. And this can reduce the amount of time that they can spend foraging. Um, and that can eventually lead to lower body conditions if they're not eating as much, um, lower reproductive success and higher susceptibility to predation. In addition to those direct impacts of climate, uh, moose can experience indirect impacts as well. So if you remember that pie chart of the moose mortality, um, parasites caused 30% of moose mortalities in the DNR study. And one of those major parasites was the winter tick. Uh, so the winter tick is shown here. It's a species of tick that parasitizes moose and other deer-like animals. Uh, moose are particularly bad at grooming them off. Um, winter ticks lay their eggs in the leaf litter layer in the spring, and then when the eggs hatch in the fall, the larvae climb up on nearby vegetation and attach themselves to moose that are passing by. Uh, the tick spends its entire life cycle then on an adult moose, and the adult female ticks again drop off the moose in the springtime to lay their eggs on the ground again. So the picture in the upper left here is kind of gross, but that's an engorged adult female uh, winter tick. Um, whoops, sorry. And then the picture in the lower left is just showing the back of a moose's ear at capture. So moose are, like I said, are not very good at grooming these ticks off when they're in a small stage. Um, and in a bad tick year, a moose can have over 100,000 ticks on its body. Um, and the combined effect of all the blood meals from all those ticks can actually cause anemia um, from the loss of blood. And also moose then are attempting to groom off these adult ticks. So they tend to be scratching themselves um, on trees and such. They, they can rub off their hair. That's what these other two pictures are showing. Um, moose with hair loss from winter ticks and that anemia from the blood loss. Uh, the more energy they're expending grooming rather than eating, um, they can get hypothermia from this hair loss, and that can uh, result in, in death in moose. Uh, the timing of snow cover can have a significant impact on winter tick abundance on moose. So warmer temperatures and earlier snow melt in spring can increase the survival of those adult female ticks that are dropping off the moose to lay their eggs. Increased precipitation during spring, summer, and fall can also positively impact the survival of the tick eggs and the larvae. Climate change also generally benefits white-tailed deer in this area. Um, deer can compete with moose, but the greater issue with deer is actually transmission of parasites, which I'll go into next. So those other two major parasites you might remember from that pie chart were brainworm and liver fluke. Um, both of these parasites can be fatal in moose, 
Um, they have similar life cycles, which are pretty complex, um, but white-tailed deer are the primary host of both of these parasites. They each also require a secondary host to complete their life cycle. And in both cases, um, that secondary host is a gastropod, so a snail or a slug. For brainworm, it's a terrestrial gastropod, and for liver fluke, it's an aquatic gastropod. Um, but moose are a dead end host of these parasites, so the they can become infected and it you know impacts them negatively. But the parasite can't fully reproduce in a moose, so moose can only become infected with these parasites in areas where deer and gastropods are present. Um, so with milder winters generally leading to higher deer survival, potentially more overlap with moose. Um, that is going to increase this parasite transmission to moose. Climate change is also likely good for the gastropods that are the secondary hosts. Um, they generally like warmer and wetter climates, so that could also increase transmission of these parasites. And then the last major cause of mortality um, from that pie chart I showed was predation from wolves. Um, so wolves are the main predator of moose in our area as seen in that study. Predation by wolves on moose calves is also an issue. Um, black bears can also be a major predator of moose calves um, during the first few weeks of their life. However, this relationship is very complex. Um, the density of white-tailed deer can affect wolf predation on moose. So larger, more dense deer populations can support higher numbers of wolves, but they can also reduce the predation pressure on moose um, by providing an alternate source of prey. Shallower snow may make it easier for wolves to move around, but it might make it harder for them to catch deer. So how will climate impact predation on moose? Uh, we don't really know the answer. There isn't really a clear, you know, single direction kind of impact of climate change on predation. So in summary, uh, climate change can impact moose both directly and indirectly. Uh, the warmer temperatures we expect to see mean moose will be heat stressed more often, which can reduce their fitness and survival over time. And then warming climate can also indirectly affect moose by increasing threats from um, these parasites, by increasing um, deer range, and uh, by increasing the, the likelihood that moose will be coming in contact with those, those parasites. Um, also the winter tick, the warming climate can also increase um, the threat of winter ticks, um, because their survival may increase with warmer temperatures and less snow. So what is our agency doing about this? Um, back in 2016, um, our agency, along with other partners, put together a vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan for select species within the 1854 ceded territory. Uh, and moose was one of the species that were highlighted. You can see in the chart on the right, so the species were placed into these boxes based on um, their sensitivity to climate change and their uh, perceived ability to adapt to those changes. And moose are placed, I don't know if you can see them there in the second box up from the bottom right, um, so they're pretty sensitive, very sensitive to climate change, and they have a relatively low capacity to adapt to those changes in climate. And as part of this plan, um, some strategies specific to moose were identified, and these focused uh, largely on the importance of continued monitoring. Um, so with such complex relationships between moose and climate, uh, this monitoring is really important. A lot of our monitoring takes place um, in partnership with other agencies. Um, one of the things that we do is we participate as a partner on the annual aerial moose survey in Northeast Minnesota to estimate population levels. We also conduct monitoring on the prevalence of those parasites that I mentioned in white-tailed deer. Um, so each year we're collecting feces from deer in moose range, and we are analyzing it to look for the presence of both brainworm larvae and liver fluke eggs. The picture here you can see is actually those yellow dots are liver fluke eggs. 
Uh, we recently also started a snow depth monitoring program, um, which we'd like to continue long term to look at changes in snow depth and snow timing. And we also do some predator monitoring. So this photo is just showing one of the wolves that we collared last year. And the data from this work that we do contributes to the state statewide uh, wolf population estimates um, by the Minnesota DNR. And like I said, as with all of our work, partnerships are key. So I would like to acknowledge um, the partners that contribute to all of this monitoring work. Uh, I got my contact info up here for anyone that needs it. Um, but yeah, at some point, climate change might cause our moose population to no longer be viable in our state. And we might need to switch our focus to species that are more resilient to changes in climate. And so I'd like to pass it over to Mike. How's that look on your end, Steve? Yeah, it looks great, Mike. All right. Well, thank you, Morgan. And um, thank you everyone for um, uh, allowing me to be here and talk. Um, talk about Omashkuz. Uh, Omashkuz is the Ojibwe word for elk. It translates as prairie moose. And from the Fond du Lac's perspective, uh, this elk restoration that we're involved in is about returning a native species to its historical range or more of its historical range in Minnesota. It's also about preparing for the future. And that's likely to be a future of change, including climate change. Um, historically, elk were widespread across nor North America, from Mexico well up uh, into the Canadian provinces and from the West Coast to the East Coast. A uh, wide variety of climates and habitats. Uh, classically, elk had, in North America have been subdivided into six subspecies. Um, if there ever really were six, the Eastern and the Miriam subspecies are now extinct. Um, and other sources today would argue that there was never really enough good evidence to, to separate out an Eastern and a Miriam subspecies. Uh, some recent genetic work uh, between Rocky Mountain and Manitoban elk um, doesn't show really enough difference at the genetic level to warrant a subspecies classification between the two. Today, the International Union of Conservation of Nature recognizes three subspecies of elk in North America, the Thule elk in California, the Roosevelt elk in the Pacific Northwest, and the Rocky Mountain elk everywhere else in North America. Today, elk are still widespread across North America. Um, from islands in southeast Alaska to uh, um, the far north of, of uh, Canadian provinces and across most of the lower 48 states. Um, again, in a wide variety of habitats and climates um, from the arid states in the southwest um, to the Pacific Northwest to the Appalachians, um, the Midwest and, and beyond. Um, many of the, the elk in Eastern uh, United States and the Midwest were largely, in fact, entirely extinct by the late 1800s in the Eastern states. Some of, some of those populations blinked out in the 1700s. All of these elk populations that have been restored in the East and the Midwestern states um, originated from populations, remnant populations in the West, and many of those from the Yellowstone National Park area. Uh, I think we are within a generation or two, um, thanks to efforts by uh, uh, particularly Kentucky, but also Tennessee, North Carolina, um, the National Park Service, West Virginia, and Virginia, 
Um, we're within a generation or two of having tens of thousands of elk in the Southern Appalachians. Um, and a lot of those, in fact, most of those elk originated from uh, elk that originated from the Yellowstone Park area. Um, so again, just showing it's a very climate hardy and adaptable animal. So a little bit of elk biology. Um, elk are more sociable than deer and often found in small herds, um, typically cow-calf herds. Um, Eastern elk populations aren't migratory, even if they originated from Western elk herds that do migrate. Eastern elk just don't have the uh, the pressures of, of uh, high elevation winter um, to force them in, onto winter ranges. So they can, they can pretty much wander wherever they want to in the East. Um, once they've been established, Eastern elk home ranges are usually small, uh, less than 30 square miles, often a lot less than 30 square miles. Um, bulls, uh, generally solitary or in bachelor groups throughout the spring, summer, and, uh, and winter. In the fall, they gather and tend to harems during their breeding season from mid-September to mid-October. Um, unlike white-tailed deer and moose, uh, twinning in elk is very rare. Single calves are the norm born in May. Um, if we look at uh, Wisconsin and Michigan uh, for some guidance on elk habitat in the upper Midwest, um, browse species, particularly browse on young aspen, zero to 10 year old aspen, are uh, one of the primary foods for elk in the Midwest. Um, however, elk really would like to be grazers. And so wherever grass and forbs are available, they will make use of those. Uh, they're quite happy to make use of acorns uh, where they're available. Unfortunately, they also have a fondness for agricultural crops, corn, soybeans, uh, sunflowers, things like that, stored forage such as hay. Um, and this has led to uh, many of the conflicts between um, people and elk are related to ag agricultural damage. Um, they will also make use of conifer and mixed conifer deciduous, deciduous stands for cover. Um, they, they are not quite as reliant as white-tailed deer on dense conifer cover um, in the wintertime. They're a bigger animal and, uh, and more apt to travel in groups. So um, winter cover is important to elk. Um, they will make use of it, but is not, it is not quite as critical in the northern latitudes as it is for white-tailed deer. Uh, so historically in Minnesota, um, elk were found across most of the state. Um, they were probably most common in the prairie and in the prairie hardwood forest transition zone. Um, we really don't know about historic elk numbers um, from reports of early explorers certainly thousands, probably tens of thousands in Minnesota. But like a lot of our native wildlife, um, they were subjected to unregulated hunting, often market hunting, um, to provide meat for eastern cities and, and uh, mining and railroad camps. Um, and they also suffered from habitat loss um, as uh, the Prairies and the forests were converted to towns and, and agriculture. So the yellow is where we used to have elk in Minnesota. Um, they were functionally extinct in Minnesota by about the 1890s. Uh, the red in the upper left is where we have elk today. Um, the small Grigola herd here um, is a result of elk that were initially brought to Minnesota to Itasca State Park from the Yellowstone National Park area. And then they were turned loose and established the Grigola elk herd. Um, and then in the 1980s, um, some elk immigrated down from Canada and established re residency in the far Northwest in Kitson County. Um, some elk are resident there today. 
uh, other groups of elk uh, migrate back and forth across the border with Manitoba. Um, today in Minnesota, we have a little over 100 year-round resident elk and probably 150 or 200 elk that migrate back and forth between Minnesota and Manitoba. The Fond du Lac Band is proposing that we take some of these elk in the Northwest um, as they exceed population goals and use them to establish another elk herd on the Eastern side of the state centered on the Fond du Lac Reservation and surrounding areas. Um, currently elk in the Northwest are managed through hunting seasons to keep their populations in check uh, due to conflicts with agriculture. Um, in fact, by by state law, the DNR has a, a very difficult time trying to increase those numbers. Um, so uh, the Fond du Lac Band is proposed, instead of shooting all of them, we take some of them to this side of the state and release them and establish another herd. So what are the objectives with this elk restoration? Um, in no particular order of importance, it's um, restoration of a native species, uh, which I would argue we have a, a moral and ethical obligation to try and accomplish wherever we can. It's a recovery of a state listed species. Um, elk in Minnesota are listed as a species of special concern. Um, I would argue that biologically they ought to be listed as endangered in Minnesota. Um, but if they're listed as special concern that allows for hunting seasons and allows um, DNR to keep their populations in check using hunting. It is to provide future hunting opportunities. If we can um, establish a, another herd and, and grow the population, it would provide future hunting opportunities uh, to tribal members and to non-tribal members in, in other parts of the state. An economic boost from elk tourism. Um, elk across the country, but particularly in the East, um, have proven to be quite the tourist attractions. Um, people coming to, to listen for elk bugling in the fall, to, to photograph elk. Uh, Duluth is already a major tourism market, and I think elk would add to that um, and, and provide an economic boost from, the, from elk viewing activities. It's also about restoring a species that can handle climate change. Um, as I previously shown, elk are adapted to a wide range of climates and habitats. And I expect regardless of what kind of climate we have in Northeast Minnesota in years to come, elk will do just fine. Um, I'm not as convinced that others of our native species will do as well. So we begin this process with um, some feasibility studies um, conducted from 2016 to 2019, led by the University of Minnesota. We looked at three different areas, uh, the Cloquet Valley, uh, well, the northern area centered on the Cloquet Valley, uh, in the central area centered on the Fond du Lac Reservation and State Forest, uh, and then in the south um, centered on the Nemagi State Forest. Um, all three of these areas are in or adjacent to historic Minnesota elk range. They're within either the 1854 or the 1837 treaty area where the Fond du Lac Band retains treaty hunting rights. Um, it was felt that if Fond du Lac, this idea originated with the Fond du Lac Band. Um, Fond du Lac so far has been leading this charge. Um, felt it was right and proper to put elk uh, in an area where, where the band members would have access to them um, and, and able to, to hunt elk under their own uh, tribal authorities. Whoop. Well, sorry. Um, okay, I guess I did want to go there. All right, so um, our fees the results of our feasibility studies showed that in all three areas, we had very strong landowner and local resident support for elk restoration. Um, we heard time and again that restoration of a native, native species was uh, one of the most important reasons for doing this. 
Um, we also heard loud and clear to minimize impacts to existing wildlife populations. Um, I think that the way to translate that is don't screw up our deer hunting. Um, and I don't think that will be an issue. Um, throughout the East, uh, elk and white-tailed deer seem to coexist quite well together. We found suitable habitat for elk in all three of the areas we looked at. And our habitat modeling suggests that um, in any of those three areas, we could support elk densities similar to what Wisconsin and Michigan are supporting with their elk herds, which works out to roughly one elk per square mile. For a variety of reasons, we selected the Fond du Lac area um, as the most appropriate place to restore elk. Um, it includes most of the Fond du Lac reservation um, and then the area generally east uh, or west of the St. Louis and Cloquet rivers over towards Floodwood and Cromwell. It's a very checkerboard ownership um, throughout the area of tribal, state, county, and private ownerships. Um, Agriculture, which has been the root of many of the problems, conflicts with elk in Northwest Minnesota is not absent from the area. There's a number of small, largely um, cattle operations and um, uh, hay pastures through here, but it, it's not quite the dominant land use uh, in this part of the state as it is in Northwest Minnesota. Uh, much more of the area is, is public land, it's forested, and timber harvest, which we can expect will provide a lot of elk habitat, is a dominant land use here. So where are we now um, with this process? The Minnesota DNR, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and the uh, three tribal organizations in Northeast Minnesota, Boys Fort, Grand Portage, and the Fond du Lac Band, um, are all in support of this effort and working together um, to see it happen. Um, we, we're in the process of hiring elk biologists to lead this effort. Uh, DNR has already hired one. I'm looking to do the same here at Fond du Lac. Um, we have secured um, 2.7 million in funding to help us get started. Um, it won't be enough to see the process all the way through. We budgeted that at over 7 million, um, but we have enough to get our planning and some initial elk movements done. We're in the process of developing our plans and protocols for how we're going to do this. Um, <clears throat> we've stepped up surveillance for chronic wasting disease. Um, elk, like any member of the deer family, white-tailed deer, moose, caribou, are susceptible to chronic wasting disease. However, they don't appear to be as susceptible to CWD as white-tailed deer are. Um, however, if elk contract CWD, it's always fatal. Um, there's been a lot of surveillance of elk in Minnesota for CWD and as well as other diseases. Um, we have a high confidence that elk in Minnesota do not have chronic wasting disease. Um, we're increasing our surveillance of deer both in Northwest Minnesota and in the Fond du Lac area um, to make sure it's also um, not found in deer herds in, in either of those locations as well. Uh, Minnesota DNR is pursuing legislative changes in this session that would uh, allow them to increase elk numbers in Northwest Minnesota. Um, so knock wood that those changes are successful. Uh, that would be helpful both to increase elk numbers in the Northwest would also increase the number of animals that are available to be moved to the northeast side of the state. Our goal is to move the first elk in 2026. Um, with small numbers of animals in the northwest Minnesota, um, I expect that um, for the foreseeable future, we're not going to be able to move big groups, but more likely 12 to 20 animals per year. And we are. Um, only considering elk in Northwest Minnesota at this time. Um, in the absence of a verified live animal test for chronic wasting disease, um, we've decided not to look out of state um, for, for a source of elk to bring, bring back here. 
Our goal um, is to ultimately move 100 to 150 animals um, to the Fond du Lac area as they become available. I think a number like this is necessary to make sure that elk get well established here. Um, we are still going to experience some loss of elk to severe winters. And um, uh, I haven't forgotten last year's winter. Um, those are still likely to be with us for a few years. Um, we are also well stocked with predators. Um, wolves, black bear um, are, are certainly predators of elk. And uh, even coyotes and bobcat are known to take elk, elk calves. So I think we need a, a robust number of elk brought here in order for the herd to establish itself and grow. Um, so I, 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 I think there's a number of positives that come from this. As previously discussed, it would be about restoring a native species. Um, the area we're looking at here around Fond du Lac is about 300 square miles in size. Uh, we estimate it could support 250 to 300 elk someday. That's our biological carrying capacity. If we're successful in doing that, we've just doubled the number of elk in Minnesota. Um, it's about recovery of a state listed species. Um, trying to get them off the list in Minnesota, providing future opportunities for tribal and non-tribal members uh, for elk hunting. Uh, hunting is an important part of Fond du Lac's culture. Uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, which has been an important supporter of this effort, is an organization founded and run by elk hunters. As previously talked about, I think there's potential for an economic boost from elk tourism. Other eastern states are investing in elk visitor centers, driving tours, viewing platforms, uh, and I, I think the potential exists for that as well in this area. And it's about restoring a species that can handle climate change. Um, as I previously discussed, I think elk are adaptable Elk are adaptable to a wide range of climates and habitat, and I think we'll be able to handle whatever changing climates and forests um, are we have here uh, as a result. Uh, elk are the very definition of charismatic megafauna. Um, they attract money and attention. Uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation is one of the best funded conservation organizations in the United States. Um, they provide a lot of money to enhance public access and elk habitat and research. And I think that will have spinoff benefits for other um, open area, early succession wildlife species. Uh, I think elk habitat has potential to provide for pollinator species, uh, woodcock, sharp tail grouse, sandhill cranes, um, even deer and turkey, um, other animals that that use those open areas, early successional forests can piggyback on habitat we create for elk. I would also argue that elk restoration could be considered an actual win for conservation. Uh, I think so much of the time in the conservation field, um, you know, a win is hanging on to what we have left. Uh, in this case, I would argue that, you know, we'd actually be restoring something we've lost. And that to me is a real win for conservation. And in this field, we could use a few more wins like that. So that's what I had if there's questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Morgan and Mike. Um, at this time, I will open it up for questions. Um, I would like to remind everybody, if you have one, please use the Q&A function. And uh, I guess maybe I'll just do a quick one right off the top of my head. You mentioned a target for elk of being 100 to 150 animals. Um, is there a known target for like a self-sustaining population? Um, and in that vein, is there... Um, a target for uh, like a population that um, can be harvestable, I guess. Um, good questions. And, um, you know, I, I will probably be retired before we have to answer those questions. So I'm going to let Morgan deal with them. Um, 
you know, I, I, I think we're going to have to let the elk tell us um, and, and, you know, we'll be monitoring how the population does, um, you know, are they reproducing, are they growing, are they expanding their range uh, and, and decide in future years, um, are they sustaining them? Is it a robust enough population to allow a hunter harvest? Uh, and if so, how big a harvest should that be? Um, other Eastern states um, that have done this are generally looking at having several hundred elk um, before opening a, a limited bull harvest. Uh, I, I think we'll, we'll have to see. Um, you know, biologically, the area could support 250 to 300 elk. Social carrying capacity may be something different, um, and that may dictate that we have a harvest at um, you know a, a smaller herd size than that. Yeah, and maybe one other kind of random thought you mentioned that this is really a partnership and a collaboration um, led by Fond du Lac. Uh, Will the species in the future going forward be co-managed by the DNR and Fond du Lac together, like a lot of resources on the, the ceded territories are, or will that be Fond du Lac will do their reservation management and then DNR will do the offsite stuff? Um, and kind of in that vein is the Fond du Lac Forestry Department also working with you guys to kind of put a place, uh, put a plan in place for like forestry management practices. Um, so I'll I'll take that last one first. Um, yeah, Fond du Lac Forestry is a, a a partner on this effort, and um, we're we're considering forest practices on tribal land um, as well as state and county land and other places where we can provide elk habitat. Um, as far as you know, going forward in the future, um, you know, the area we are proposing to put elk um, is a mix of. Fond du Lac tribal land, um, and when elk are standing on Fond du Lac land, then Fond du Lac will be responsible for their management. Um, but even within the boundaries of the Fond du Lac reservation, uh, it's a very checkerboard ownership. The Fond du Lac band currently owns less than 50% of the land within their reservation. The rest is state, county, private land, um, even university land. Um, uh, and and state licensed hunters um, actively hunt on the reservation, including Fond du Lac land uh, for deer, bear, and other species. Um, and then, of course, outside the reservation, um, you know, in in some ways, I think the DNR would would be uh, you know the the lead agency on elk management, but they're also within that fifty four treaty area. Um, so you know, elk, elk would ultimately be co managed by the DNR and all three bands in the in the 54 treaty area. Uh, looks like we got a question here with the close social practices of elk. Is there a concern that a single case of CWD could impact the entire herd? Yes. And looks like that might be it. Does any, if, I'll give it a couple seconds here. If anybody else has any questions they want to ask last minute. Um, yeah, if there's no other questions, uh, you know, I just want to extend our gratitude to you, Mike and Morgan, for uh, their um, knowledge and time to be here with us. And thanks as well to all of you for spending your time with us this afternoon. Um, just a reminder, Julian Madison have provided some links in the chat if you want to like if you want to learn more about the Twin Ports Climate Conversation, and we hope to see you all again soon. So thank you very much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.